And now let me introduce our guests. First, James Boyce. James is the author of Born Bad, Original Sin and the Making of the Western World, the reason why he is here today. Born Bad is a tour de force on the concept of original sin, how it's manifested itself and how its explanation, justification, denial and various permutations have ebbed and flowed through the ages. James is also the author of Van Diemen's Land, a history for which he won the Tasmanian Book Prize and was shortlisted for the New South Wales, Victorian and Queensland Premier's Literary Awards, as well as the Prime Minister's Award. James' previous book, 1835, The Founding of Melbourne and the Conquest of Australia, also won the Tasmanian Book Prize and the Age Book of the Year Award, as well as being shortlisted for a whole bunch of other awards. And now Bob. Well, I don't think there would be a person here who isn't familiar with some aspect of Bob Brown's life or didn't have an opinion about him. <laughs> I had to see a medical specialist earlier this week and mentioned this session that I was chairing uh, his immediate response was that Bob Brown is an Australian hero. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say I suspect that that view is shared by many Australians <laughs> and the applause took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> and I'm sure that that view of Bob is uh, shared by many who don't necessarily vote for the Greens. Those of us who attended Bob's opening festival address last night were not only stimulated and challenged by what he had to say, but also charmed by his talented piano playing <laughs> as he introduced us to his anthem to the, to the anthem to the planet called Earth Song, which he wrote when he was 16. <laughs> Bob's at the Writers' Festival because of his book, Optimism, Reflections on a Life of Action, and what an action man he has been. After leading a multifaceted life as a GP, Bob became director of the Tasmanian Wilderness Society in 1978 and led the campaign to save the Franklin. He served in the Tasmanian Parliament from 1983 until 1996 when he was elected to the Australian Senate, from which he resigned in 2012, but not into retirement. He's now working with Sea Shepherd Australia and also using his Bob Brown Foundation as a powerful voice for the environment. It might interest the audience to know that James and Bob didn't previously know each other, even though they both come from Tassie. <laughs> We're not even related. <laughs> <laughs> and we live at least two kilometres apart. Yeah. <laughs> Such a big place, that Tassie. <laughs> In our shared email correspondence preparing for the session, James told Bob that he did much of his writing at Eggs and Bacon Bay, just near where Paul's partner uh, lived, and no doubt where Bob did a lot of his writing as well. James said he spotted Bob a few times when he was out walking. As James said, it is a special thing that both books were written from that same bit of special earth, and, now, and how special it is that they are here today to share them with us. Please welcome James and Bob. Thanks, Simon. Now to business. James and Bob, this is a pretty tricky topic we're dealing with here today. So let's see where you stand from the outset. Bob, it's clear from your book that you're firmly in the optimism camp, even though, as you say in your book, you ha have had your brushes with pessimism and despair, even to the edge of committing suicide. Mind you, any of us would have been driven to despair had we been meted out the same trash as you have had from the Murdoch press, Ellen Jones, <laughs> the exclusive brethren, and homophobes. And James, despite this impressive tome of yours on original sin as legacy manifested in all sorts of different ways, your own opinions expressed in the book suggest it would be unfair to put you in the pessimism camp, especially as you say that original sin is more akin to mental illness than to a healthy religion. Bob, let's start with you. Well, I'm, I am an optimist because I choose to be. Uh, and as I said to a business group this morning, if you're going to start up a dress shop or a pie shop, uh, surely optimism is going to help you be successful, whereas pessimism will help you fail. It's as simple as that. We, uh, we don't know really why we're here, what, uh, what lies ahead. 
we do know that we've got a purpose because uh, it was enwrapped in the start of the universe 14 billion years ago in the Big Bang, and I know that because we've got the concept of purpose and we talk about it. We don't know what it is, therefore we have every right to create our own purpose, and as far as I'm concerned, that is to keep we human beings, this fantastic intelligence of the universe here on this one little planet, so far as we know, which has it, going. And uh, that, that does mean us using our collective intelligence, God-given if you like, uh, evolved if you, if you like, but always uh, there in the Big Bang as a potential in the universe. We've got to use that to keep this extraordinary experiment of the universe being aware of itself going. Uh, but it's fraught and all the signs, we're using 120% uh, of the Earth's living resources now, that's why forests and fisheries and uh, farmland, arable farmland's going back every day, we human beings. We're the biggest marauding herd of mammals ever on the face of the planet, but we're intelligent. And the question is, uh, are we going to use that intelligence to bring ourselves into a sustainable relationship with each other and the planet so we can get on with the joyride of this intellect going into the future, or is it going to all end up badly? Uh, it's optimism that'll help the first. Pessimism is certainly going to help the second, and I'm not about to do that. I'm an optimist. Mm. And so far as the planet... It, <laughs> and so far as that, that quest to save the planet is concerned, uh, do you think that we're taking the right steps? No. We just voted for the Abbott government. <laughs> uh, but, you know, 90% of Australians two years ago voted for six mega coal ports inside the Great Barrier Reef. That's the, both the big parties want that, and that would uh, effectively triple the amount of greenhouse gases being put into the atmosphere by Australians who are already amongst the big, biggest uh, polluters of the atmosphere ever in human history. And tucked away in yesterday's Australian was the news that if uh, we just stay at current levels of pollution of the atmosphere within five centuries, our, our kith and kin, people like us just alive then, are going to be dealing with nine to 32 metres sea level rises. All the big coastal cities of the world are swamped. So it's not very smart. So despite that, despite that depressing scenario, mm. you see, still seem to be saying that because of our innate intelligence and wisdom, that in the long term we will get it and that we'll, we'll be able only, to turn it around. Uh, only in, and James' uh, book helps a lot to analyse why we're falling short of the mark. Only if we, o only if we overcome our instinctive uh, selfishness. Uh, and I, uh, to shorthand that, when we get to vote as we go to the ballot box for our grandkids and not ourselves, we'll be getting it right. Just, uh, just a little thing, at, at, to go back to that election, last election, um, the government was elected to remove world heritage status from, and allow loggers back into the great forest of Tasmania, the great, greatest forest on the southern hemisphere in terms of immensity. Uh, and yet when an opinion poll was done separately after the election, 80% of people didn't want that. And when you got to young Australians, the youngest voters, 97, I've never seen an opinion poll result like this before, 97% didn't want it, yet most people had voted for it. It's because the environment and, and the future and the long term, at the interests of our grandkids, we are schooled to put that second to our venal, selfish selves. Uh, and yes, the Murdoch media helps that along. Uh, but the capitalist, uh, and I'm in favour of free enterprise, but the capitalist system out of control, which is meant to be kept uh, in the public, wider public interest by elected democratic governments is in fact doing the reverse. It's, it's lobby, lobbyists have the democratic governments in their keep and they're doing it against the wider interest of the electorate. And, but they own the means of communication largely and of advertising and so on. And so we got it wrong, but I, I believe the collective wisdom of people when confronted to Cyclones, Category 4 and 5, crossing the Australian coast today. Sure, that's happened before. But we are going to be... But they're going to get more powerful and more destructive. And, and we are going... And, and the bushfires and all the predicted things out of climate change, even as we voted to have the carbon tax taken away so that instead of polluters paying to fix up the environment, the taxpayers paid the polluters. If you don't mind, that's what people voted for at the last election. Under the simple rub rubric get rid of the carbon tax. We're, we're more sophisticated than that and we can do better than that. And uh, 
it, it would be easy to have a reactive depression, that is, be pessimistic to what is happening in our society, and a lot of young people are. But I've been around long enough to know that uh, you can override that, and it's very important to override that. Put the things you can't deal with on the shelf and get into those you can. That's why I got into politics. I never became minister for anything because I wasn't supporting that system. But it was a great privilege to be there, and I, I think we'll see a much more pluralist, uh, more parties, more voices in, in our democratic systems in the future. And uh, there's very heartening signs there, not least those opinion polls about the forest, for example, which are just uh, the tip of the iceberg. People are good-hearted, and they want their grandkids to be happy. Those two things, if put in the box seat, will radically change the way we're malfunctioning and get us back on track. Well, you made a nice reference to James's book just a little while ago, and uh, James, um, I referred a little bit earlier your words in your book, Original Sin, as mental illness. In the light of what Bob's been saying about the environment, um, um, the climate change, is that a possible explanation? Well, the, um, I, s I refer to it as... That's in the closing, isn't it, in the, in the, in the final acknowledgements. Um, when I'm reflecting on, on this strange journey I went on in writing a book about original sin. And I did, uh, what I'm reflecting on there is that I found wisdom in the most unlikely place as well. It's, it's, a, it's a very strange and disturbing tradition and has a lot to answer for. But my, as I sort of spent three years immersed in the subject, to my surprise, I... I uh, I didn't change my mind. It's still more akin to mental illness than healthy religion. But then the next line was that there's often a fine line between mental illness and sanity, a very fine line. As, uh, and um, this, this tradition that we, that we carry, I mean, I think the point of my book is, is not so much to say, you know, that I'm not, not talking about what is true. I'm talking about what we believed to be true. And in some ways, I think Bob is as well. You know that you know it's Bob acknowledges that there are grounds. You know that you can rationally, you can be a pessimist or an optimist if you look at it. And and for for a time, you chose pessimism. Well, in fact, it's logical to be pessimistic mm. when you look at what's happening in the world. You know, so so the debate about um, what is true is a, you know that's a legitimate debate, but it's it's. The really crucial thing is why, why we believe what we believe to be true and what the implications of that are. And, you know, in terms of the, um, what Bob's talking about, um, you know, which is as, as simple as trying to, you know, save the planet and save some sort of decent society, um, always what social reformers and environmental reformers have come up against in the West is definitions of what is realistic. I mean, how many times has... Have you, Bob, been told, you know, that's not realistic? Mm. Uh, that's not politically realistic or in international affairs. That's not, you know, that's not how the world works. Now and I it... feel like I'm back in the Senate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that comes from what, what I'm interested in, because if we're really going to... We, we've got to overcome and move beyond those definitions of what realistic, because they're actually ingrained assumptions about human nature. People will say, that doesn't fit. Human beings aren't like that. You know, they'll have it. We have when we say that's human nature. How often do we use that to expand possibility rather than to limit possibility? So often it's used to limit possibility, despite we know the capacities of human beings. People say, "Oh no, it's not." You know, human nature. You know, people will be selfish. Da da da. Now, there's a history to that idea. This is not just. This is not ingrained. This is not. This is this idea. This common sense understanding of what is realistic what can be done, uh, gets in the way all the time. So, I mean, you, you'll find opinion polls say with um, most Australians will, su will support the end of old growth logging, but a, a, a significant number will believe it's not yet realistic, you know, in the Tasmanian context. This sort of stuff happens, the same with coal exports. So my book, my book is not about old growth logging or coal exports, but it is about how that idea of human nature, these assumptions of what the human condition is, what human beings are like, where, they, where those um, ideas come from, and that none of us are born with a sort of clean slate. We actually carry ancestral memory, ancestral tradition within us. And our creation story, 
what I call in the book our creation story. We have a creation story the same as other cultures have a creation story. And in the same way as in other cultures, I mean, we have actually quite a lot of wisdom about the importance of creation stories in other cultures. We know that their importance is not about their literal truth. It's not just about their, their moral worth. We know that these stories sort of run deep within cultures in different ways in terms of shaping our consciousness, consciousness how we see the world. And I talk about original sin, which is a particular interpretation of Adam and Eve that's not believed in, by, by the way, by Jewish people. It's not believed in by Muslims who also share Adam and Eve. It's not even believed in by Eastern Christians. This is a Western interpretation of a story. Very strange story on first reading. It's a story that the sin of, um, of, of Adam was inherited by every subsequent human being. So we're all born under the wrath of God, but we're also born with a depraved human nature from birth. So we're all innately this. Now, this idea, which we think is just religious past, nonsense, I suggest and argue, actually, this idea of human nature carries through into the secular world and can be found premised in a lot of economic thought, a lot of philosophical thought, a lot of political thought. And so that's... It's not... I'm, I'm uh, very... I'm, I... I don't believe that this is true. I mean, obviously, original sin. I mean, who here believes in the doctrine of original sin? I hope that probably uh, we can't... I doubt that there's anybody. Be careful there. Yeah, but it might be. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is it's not, about, it's not about whether you believe it to be true. It's about that it's a modern fallacy to think that we all start afresh, that we're all free of this inheritance. We carry within us... So, and if we genuinely want to be free of it, if we genuinely want to expand our notions of um, what is realistic and genuinely cut through some of those divides, I think that it's important that we reconnect imaginatively with the spiritual traditions and other traditions that have made us who we are as human beings. Because we're part of something bigger. We're not just isolated human beings. We're connected to each other. We're connected to our ancest ancestors. We're part of, part of, and so we need to have that dialogue, not because out of some reverence, respect for tradition, but just because that has shaped how we see the world. And of yeah. course, necessarily, um, as you refer um, in your book, then this, a lot of this um, tradition and this theology of original sin arises also out of mythology uh, and, and disputes uh, through the ages by theologians trying to fine tune Mm. That, that concept all the time. Yeah. Both of your books are permeated with religion. Uh, James has necessarily uh, given the topic of his book. I try to minimise it as much as possible, but it's hard to get rid of it altogether. <laughs> that would be impossible, I think. But, yeah, Bob, the theme absolutely. of God and Christianity is revisited many times in your book as well. That's right. Uh -huh. Let me put this to you both. Just this month, that ubiquitous broadcaster, author and comedian, Stephen Fry said on television that if God existed, he was, quote, utterly evil, capricious and monstrous and deserved no respect whatsoever. <laughs> Fry was referring to a God-created world so full of injustice and pain. Fry said, the moment you banish God, life becomes simpler, purer, cleaner, more worth living. Is he right, Bob? Well, I, life changed for me as a, as a formative Presbyterian. I was in the Calvinist camp, uh, brought up in it, uh, when I understood that not just God is love, as was over the Presbyterian Sunday School in Armidale in New South Wales, over the, the stage, but that he, there's hateful and dreadful and extraordinary... Look at 21 Christ, Coptic Christian men being beheaded uh, in Libya during the week. Uh, God could have intervened on that for his own chosen people but didn't. Uh, the fact is God can't be all powerful and all good uh, and, and the, the whole thing is we don't know anything about God uh, even whether there is such a thing and we've got to get on with formulating our existence on this planet and making sure of our safety on this planet without presuming anything in the name of God and, and one of the things that comes very loudly I think through uh, Born Bad, James's book, is where men, and they nearly always are, uh, have been, get hold of God and say, I am, I know what God thinks, and then, and then I'll kill you if you think differently. And that's what was happening on that Libyan beach the other day. Mm. And it's outrageous, and we can no longer allow 
people taking upon themselves to be God, which is what they're doing de facto. We, are, we have to assume we are alone. Uh, we, whether it's a blueprint from God uh, to put us alone here on this planet to make our own way because that's the evidence and we will either make it as a collective of people willing to get our house in order or we won't. It's, it's, it's uh, screamingly there in front of us. So uh, I think uh, the book is an analysis of how badly people have got it in the past and particularly it's Machiavellian how in the Christian church those who believed that everybody was bad and there was no redemption and then made money out of baptising kiddies so that they would escape hell and go to heaven instead and that's what it became was a money making machine and that money makes power uh, were a very perverse and, and it's, a, it's a terrible indictment on how we came to then overrun much of the rest of the world that is western culture and insist it do the same uh, and killing a few people along the way in the name of God. Well, uh, and the Thirty Years' War, which just gets one chapter, in, one paragraph in James's book, is, a, is an example of ISIS isn't new. You know, it's, uh, it's people who believe and use the name of God to proselytise youngsters to do dreadful things to each other. And in that sense, I think the concept of God can be very, very dangerous. Uh, we, uh, if God's there... He or she isn't all powerful and all good at the same time. That is an illogicality. So either not powerful enough to intervene, we better get on with uh, handling our own affairs, or not all good, in which case we better get on and, and, and make it a better place using our own God-given, God if you like, intelligence. James, you might want to pick up on something that Bob said, but also your response to Stephen Fry. Well, well, the God that Stephen Fry, in terms of the God that Stephen Fry is talking about, um, I mean, I am st still, despite this journey into original sin, st still um, a Christian, but I am certainly don't think I would join in and have no problem with what Stephen Fry says, which some people might find that contradictory, because the sort of God that Stephen Fry is talking about, um, I don't believe ever existed. Um, and to the extent that people believed that he existed, I joined with Stephen Fry to cut him down because he was a pretty malicious, judgmental sort of bloke. He was a bloke after all, wasn't he, up there? Um, but the, um, the, there's been original sin. Um, what I didn't talk about before was that Bob's quite right. Bob, the original sin, the other, other side of it was that there was the need for universal salvation, which is another... The reason why everybody, everybody was stuffed, which made it mean everybody needed to be saved. So it was very central to, the, to church power and church authority and to church control. Because um, um, it was the only way of explaining why everybody was stuffed. <laughs> everybody would go to hell unless they, unless they had a baptism um, in, the church, in the one true church. But the... In terms of the, the, the Christian history of the West is more complex than that one dominant church tradition. Uh, as in everything, there have been minority dissenting traditions um, who've expressed a different spirituality and most, the most profound difference is in fact they've surrendered that idea of God um, and they've, had a, they've had put another emphasis on the creation story in that God, God being with every human being, you know, that we're created in the image of God that God's presence right through the earth, God runs through all of nature, through all of human life. And so far from God being able to be located and pinpointed and defined and regulated, as in, as in the dominant BLC God, there is another God. A person up there. <laughs> yeah. But that God, of course, is, as Bob quite rightly says, doesn't, uh, is, is impossible to talk about. And if, if anyone's got the language for it, I certainly have. But it's not a God of power. Um, well, one of the things I think is that we should get back to Mother Nature. Maybe mm. we should re restore it as a she, uh, because uh, th that was back there originally and, it, and is in many of the more ancient beliefs. But, um, uh, and Hildegard of Bingen, in, mm. in your book, and uh, other great women mystics down the line have tried to reassert uh, the female component in uh, the way the world is shaped. Mm. And I think a bit more of that wouldn't be a bad thing. Although I do go, I, and I think in democratic 
on this planet. Uh, the empowerment of women is absolutely crucial. The equal empowerment of women, and we're a long way short of it in this country and elsewhere, is absolutely crucial to our well-being into the future. Uh, that, that being said, uh, in a way, the idea of the, the debate about God uh, gets us away from the responsibility on ourselves to make sure our grandchildren are safe through what we do now. And mm. I quote the poem from Drew Dellinger, the American mm. poet in the book, who says, and I, if I paraphrase, uh, I'm awake at 3.23 in the morning and I can't sleep because my great-grandchildren keep coming to me in my dreams and saying, what did you do? when the reptiles and the animals and the birds were going to extinction? What did you do when the climate started changing? Did you get off the street when they thieved democracy off the people? What did you do? And, and if there's a, a voice, a, a still voice to be hearing in the night that we should be responding to, yeah. that's it. I, can I, I actually think, I mean, Bob wouldn't use this language, but Bob's in, uh, when I read optimism, I actually, put you, you're in, to me, you're in that tradition, this dissenting spiritual tradition in the West, you know, that Hildegard of Bingen is, and, because, it's, because it's your optimism actually comes, it's not a superficial optimism that you look out in the world and you see good and that you see that good people just triumph or that you for a second underestimate the power of evil. But what you see is at the heart, at the centre, underneath human selfishness, underneath all the, the powers that be, an innate powerful goodness that if, when it can be unlocked, when it can be uncovered, when it can be seen, when it can be celebrated, when it can be recognised, it can triumph, it can be released. So it's about learning to see, it's about learning to hear, it's about learning to see what's already there, what's truly there, what's at the heart and the essence. Now that is the heart of the alternative tradition. That's the heart of what the medieval mystics, That's what right. Celtic Christians believed. So God is already there, God is already with everyone, God is already right through nature. The process of conversion is learning to see, learning to hear, unlocking that, rather than bringing in some set of dogma, you know? Which but is, is that um, different to saying simply that God is good, good is God? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm with you that once we start arguing, you know, about the... You can almost get distracted, can't you, off the main point? Can't, it doesn't matter And indeed, anymore. that is one of the points that Bob, I think, makes yeah. in his book in those times where you do make references to God, is that it's a cop-out often for us. Mm. Because we're, we put him off the solution to another time, you know, to a life hereafter. We, we are not trying to deal with issues in the present, massive as they are, not trying to resolve those, but suggesting to ourselves that there is another explanation, a broader solution, which is way beyond our understanding. Yeah, and in, a, in a, another new book just out, which is The Rise and Fall of Guns, the logging company in Tasmania, Quentin Berrison, who's here from here in Perth, quotes Machiavelli uh, and in The Brinks again. And uh, here's Machiavelli saying, well, whatever else, uh, get the drop on your opponents. And the important thing is that by lying, and I'm paraphrasing again, by lying and cheating, overrun those who would be honest. And that, there's too much of that in this world. And the question is, how do those who don't lie and cheat, good-hearted, reflective people, stand up to those who will... will uh, as soon smack, smack you down as listen to an argument. It, it's, it, it's a real test of how and where we're going to. Uh, and and I want these days to quote Bertrand Russell, who says that what's wrong with the world is that the stupid are cocksure uh, and the intelligent are full of self-doubt. And the only answer I've got to that is, well, the intelligent folk get over it. Um, <laughs> And, and we've got to stand up to, to the tyrants, the Putins of the world, the, the, the nasty, self-invested in, people who don't care what happens to other people. And, and it's, it's almost a contradiction in the way that human life on this planet uh, has, has come about. It's all, it is almost a test, uh, but it's up to intelligent, good-hearted people to stand up to the nastiness that's on the planet, and that will uh, that will warrant taking very powerful measures against wrong. Now we we've done that. We have a legal system through democracies, which deals with crime, and 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 uh, takes people out of society 
who are destructive and murderous and, and rapists and thieves and so on. Uh, but how we do that in terms of the power of the world and the only answer to it, and I, I lay that out in the book I have, is global democracy. I'm a Churchillian in, in, in a view of Churchill's view that all, of all the forms of government, uh, democracy is full of faults, but it's better than everything else that's been tried. And we have to have global democracy. We have to get past allowing the corporations de facto and the Saudi royal family and, and the People's Liberation Army or the said communists who run with a jackboot, who run uh, affairs in Beijing to rule the world. Why shouldn't five billion people at the ballot box rule the world? I'd, I'd put my faith in that before these individuals who have arrogated power unto themselves any day. I think both of you have outlined lots of reasons why we should be pessimistic. Um, however, <laughs> we live in one of the richest countries in the world, but gosh, we're not too happy about what's going, going on in Canberra at the moment. But I don't want to talk about politics per se, even though what happens in politics necessarily reflects, reflects what happens to our environment. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Rudd described the challenge of the environment as the greatest moral issue of our time. Now, he, he sort of lost his way on that one a little bit, um, and he was probably about 30 years behind Bob Brown um, in using that sort of terminology. But from the perspective of religious values and the, challenging, and the challenges facing our planet, was Ruddy sort of in the right direction? Oh, well, yes, of course, and God sees each sparrow fall and consider the lilies of the field. I mean, it's... it's and and uh, we have nature, the bond with the beauty of this planet, built into us. It's another genetic component that uh, is inescapable, which is uh, why we give flowers to each other, not chainsaws. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and yet we, we have to stand in defence of it, you know, of this little planet. Uh, where there's very little of the natural environment, this biosphere which cradled us into existence, that's left. And yet our bond with it is very, very strong. It explains our psychology as well as our uh, anatomy. And we should keep it. And we, we should have it left, not just in the At Attenborough archives, but as a reality, so that with the phenomenal technology coming down the line, our nine or ten billion kith and kin at the end of this century can enjoy it. And that's why I'm so pleased that there's a few folk from Sea Shepherd here because they've got the guts and gumption to get up and go down in the, fa in the absence of government and Canberra to uphold international law and get in the way, at risk of their own life and limb, of the, the marauding, uh, illegal killing of thousands of our fellow warm-blooded mammals, the great whales in, in Antarctica. And, and in a way, they're showing that the real answers to the future of the planet are going to come out of society. They won't come out of the current setup. But it's our job at the ballot box to put in people who are going to save the whales and are going to take action on it, not to those who are going to stand back and say, oh, no, our trading relationship with Tokyo is much more important. James. Mm. James, you make reference in your book to the present environmental crisis, not the environment comes up much in your book, but I was intrigued by this phrase that you uh, put in your book, that the present environmental crisis brings the question of salvation once more to the fore. And that's an intriguing kind of a concept. What do you mean by that? Well, <clears throat> as I was mentioning before, the, the other side of original sin is an obsession with salvation. Um, so the Western, Western culture, um, and we, we tend to, we sometimes forget that actually most, not all religions have this same notion of, you know, it's, it, um, Christianity does have a, have a particular concern with it, and with original sin it's, it's sharpened even higher. So it's really, and um, it's in many ways defined the Western condition, and, and I'd suggest I mean, I obviously can speculate here beyond what I do in the book, um, but the suggestion that really it can explain a lot of Western history, you know, this creation story. This, there's a deep restlessness in the Western soul. Um, and once we lost our God, you know, in the secular age, I, I, again, I'd suggest we didn't necessarily change our view of the human condition and we haven't changed... Um, the need for salvation. It's just now we've got this whole smorgasbord on offer. And most of that smorgasbord is, in fact, you know, stuff that really just 
doesn't save us at all. We just, we just, there's something, it speaks to there being something wrong with us, and here, you know, consume this product, or buy that, or take that bit of advice, or follow that self-help movement, and you can be, you know, you'll find a sort of false salvation. Now, so that, um, we've got to be careful of that, just sort of trying to fill that hole, but the, in terms of the environmental crisis, um, what I'm pointing to there is I'm just taking it for granted that um, I'm not trying to enter into the discussion, but that we are at a genuine point where we, uh, in, in history, where if we're concerned to save this incredibly privileged and in historical terms, I mean extraordinarily privileged and even in historical terms peaceful existence that we have, but this, the level of prosperity, um, the level of privilege we have now is just unparalleled. I mean, um, you know, sort of as a historian, it's quite a historian and former social worker, so I'm sort of aware of the reality of poverty and the reality of need and, you know, in Tasmania, Bob and I, you know, live in the poorest state in the country on all sorts of indices. But, you know, in global terms and in comparative terms, we live in such a privileged space. But the, there can be no doubt, can there, that the, the planet, I mean, who can, this is not a question of opinion, it's a question of what we're being told, um, that the choices have to be made. And, and I'm, so it's interesting that the West, which has always had this obsession with salvation, now in effect, you know, can maybe use some of that energy, that, that, that tradition in a positive way to have a look at what that might mean in the modern sense. Because I do think, I do think that, I mean, one of, the, one of the dangers of the Green Movement, and I mean, I, do, I, I say this with utmost respect for, for, what the, for what the Green Movement's achieved, but the danger is always that it can be presented as um, that it's separate from the old tradition. You, you know, you had counted this in Tassie, didn't we? We would be presented as if the Green Movement was something new. We all had to start all over again, you know, and that the carriers of the other tradition were the ones who were in touch with, with the tradition and the Greens were just a bunch of outsiders with a whole lot of newfangled ideas. Everything that the past was nonsense. We were the, you know, we're the first ones who know how to love the planet. You know, the people before, they didn't know how to care for the forest. They didn't know how to... Farm. Now, that, that rhetoric was used very powerfully in Tasmania, wasn't it? Um, it, the Greens have become much better at countering it now and um, uh, for good reason because if you, if you present, there's nothing more depressing than be believing. Nothing, nothing feeds pessimism more than if you believe you have to start all over again. Yes, but as you Machiavelli know. said, if you want to change the, the, the system, get ready to be crushed by those who have the power and the money. And that's what you'll see. Every, any, any enlightening idea that's come along has, has faced that. The suffragettes are a very good example. Mm. So it's uh, getting criticised. If you weren't being criticised, you might have to wonder whether you're going to change anything. And, you know, I, I think uh, we'll know if we've got it pretty right when the Minister for the Environment in any government is at least as powerful as the Treasurer. Because, uh, you know, ecology is understanding the household. That's the Greek word, the Greek derivation. Economy is managing it. Uh, we'd be very smart if we understood it before we managed it. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge in waiting to get the Minister for the Environment, not only so that she or he will be as powerful as the Treasurer, but will enforce the laws that representatives coming out of the public have put in place for the environment. And this current bout of getting rid of green tape is simply an anti-environmentalism, uh, a, a fight back from the exploiters of the planet through the power of the lobby they have. It's this Machiavellian thing of trying to crush the, the change that's coming. It's not going to win, but it'll have some successes along the way. Which neatly leads me to my next question. And, and we, well, I want to finish on a positive note, in a sense, uh, by your providing us, each of you, maybe Bob in particular, with a kind of a way forward uh, before we go into questions. Um, so, so following up on what you just said, how do we take the environment and, um, and all that goes with it out of the hands of the short-term cycle of politicians 
and the party that's currently in power, because that's what seems to be happening. I mean, every electoral cycle, we have promises before the election, invariably get broken after the election, um, and the people who put them there in the first place seem to become powerless through that. You made reference to the terrific young people um, who are leading the way with great courage um, and ingenuity, uh, but what about the rest of us? Well, the question is whether we're post-catastrophic creatures or pre-catastrophic, and, and there's the question. Do we have the catas catastrophe and then hopefully learn from it? And, and uh, you, that would have to be a, a one hope, I think. Or have we got this intelligent collect intelligence collectively to stop an environmental meltdown on the planet, uh, which you know, scientists are pointing to, and which logic says this finite planet can't withstand the growth philosophy of exploitation of it, which currently, this is materialism, which currently has, is a religion, I believe, which has the world by the throat, which gives salvation through making money. Mm. Uh, and it's absurd. It's, it's patently self-defeating. My, uh, the, the long-term view is very, very important, and I think it begins with us as individuals, and I'll go back again to the, uh, what I think is a fundamental uh, change of mind we need when we uh, are participants in a democracy where one vote, one value for one person and I think one planet rules. That is, will we go up the school path to the ballot box next time and vote for our grandchildren? Or will we keep voting for ourselves? And it's not until we vote for our grandchildren and people who are standing up for the long-term interests of the planet, including its environment and fairness around the world, that will get it right. And it's a, it's a big challenge, but it begins with us. It's not somebody else who's going to change that. It begins with us. And if the Greens aren't the vehicle, and I think they're the best thing going at the moment, and if they aren't the vehicle for doing that, something else will come along and, and supplant it. But we've got to get past voting for whoever it is is going to send us a $500 cheque in the mail just before the election or tell us that they're going to increase spending on everything you can think of just before the election, or tell us, you know, these blandishments. Uh, we've got to do better than that. We can do better than that, and it does involve a better relationship with our representatives and candidates, ringing them up and asking them, what are you going to do about the Tarkine wilderness or the, or the coal ports inside the Great Barrier Reef or the four billion taken out of foreign aid uh, by the Abbott government to build more roads here in Australia, for goodness sake, in the wealthiest country on the planet. Uh, these are things that we have to get involved in, and, and much more as individuals, if we're going to have a functioning democracy. But voting for the grandchildren is, is a simple idea, a guide to, to those of us who, who are still trapped in thinking it's a, it's a contest between Labor and Liberal governments. Much more important than that. And we have to get individuals in there who, if necessary, will cross the floor and stand up to their parties in terms of fostering the interests of those who come after us. And I think, uh, sorry, uh, to go back to salvation. Uh, you know, salvation uh, and the selling of indulgences and the, the huge wealth of the church to get into heaven uh, got it wrong. Uh, if we use our lives to make sure the lives of our progeny, our kith and kin, our fellow human beings on this planet, are the better for us being here, that's salvation. It's not a personal uh, mytho mythological hope about something we don't understand, some afterlife. I'm talking about the life here on the planet, and we know we can do that. Yeah. And, and I think our salvation is simply thinking, working, acting, tithing our incomes, whatever, to make sure this planet, this biosphere, which gave us everything we have and upon which we're totally dependent, is handed on to those next generations, the better for us being here, not the worse. The forces of opposition are massive. Uh, I recall when Twiggy Forrest and Gina Reinhart and the mining lobby were taking out massive advertisements right through Australia, ax the tax. Uh, and they were spectacularly successful. Uh, I was chairing a press club function at which the Prime Minister was speaking here in Perth, and Twiggy rocked up in his high-vis vest um, to make a statement, obviously, having just come from the rally with Gina, 
where most she had that most ugly visage on the television, uh, shrieking um, in a terrible voice, "Axe the tax," um, and you could see that uh, you could feel that sense of power in a sense in the room that Twiggy was um, was implementing, and that 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 chorus from down on on the esplanade. Um, Yes, but that's see, what I'm referring to. Well, that's a straight implication. There's, a, there's two phrases. They just weren't expostulating the second. Axe the tax, sell out your grandkids, sell out, sell out wider society. Uh, and yes, they were, they were right. And the Howard government period, Howard Costello government, gave $30 billion in tax cuts, which is continuing now. We don't have the mining revenue to eat away at hospitals, schools, the, uh, the environmental amenity of society. Uh, we should have uh, capitalised and had a wealth fund, which I, as leader of the Greens, was pushing for at the, in that period and, and making sure we had money set aside for a, a rainy day for, for all the amenities, and including education, and, and uh, so that we didn't have to cut overseas aid. But people were caught by Axe the Tax because it was an appeal to their own hip pocket nerve, which we're told, going right back to well, mid last century. And, and it worked. And while it keeps working, we're in real trouble. Until we get it right and say, well, is this going to be good for those who come after us? Or even those who are not getting a fair go in our own society or elsewhere on the planet, uh, we're not going to get it right. Yeah, it worked beautifully, because that's part of the paradigm that's going wrong. And that's what we've got to change. And it reinforces the materialism, the religion of materialism to which you were referring. We've got about yes. 10 minutes left. Um, and this is a good time to pause now for some questions. It's a bit hard for us to see through there, but um, please, let's start from the front here. Oh, a microphone, excellent. Bob, my question's directed to you, and it's, um, I think you uh, have put some good reasons for being an optimist, but I'm a pessimist from one uh, perspective alone, and that is that we've got front benches in federal and labor uh, and state governments that are fundamentalist Christians that believe in uh, creationism, that believe that climate change could only come at God's hand. How do we deal with that? Well, vote them out. <laughs> um. Thank you. Here, <laughs> here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But most people don't know that that's the case. Well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, you say that most people don't know. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, and, and James talks a lot about denial in his book. Uh, not being interested in saying, oh, politics, I'm not interested in it, is, uh, is a great form of a selling out on the planet and the future. I think we know a lot more than we want to know about, and we, we turn our backs on the detail. But, but it's time we faced up to our responsibility in a democracy. You have to. Uh, the, the power of the people, mind you, information is the currency of democracy, says Jefferson. And uh, it's very important that we get balanced information, and we've lost that, you know. Uh, and we, we need to get that. Oh, I think things are improving, though, under the, you know, with the new cyberspace connectivity we've got. Uh, but uh, voting people, we, J.K. Galbraith, the great uh, American economist said, parliaments almost exactly reflect the people who vote them in. And so I'm not, I'll, I, I took a lot of flack and I will continue about politicians, but uh, we as a society are responsible for them. They're as good as, as the voters and, and we've got to lift our game in going to that ballot box. And we have a yes. question over here. But following on exactly from what you've just said, and can I just say, um, I'm so sad that you're not there anymore. I'm happy for you because I'm, I'm sure your life's wonderful now. I'm yes, so, I'm not sad. I'm <laughs> sad. But, but for us, I'm so, so sad. I totally believe in everything that you've said. But what you just said then uh, about the p politicians reflect the population, that is the, the trouble. If you looked at, at, when we all looked at the last election, if you looked at the Vox Pops and interviews on the, on the street, 
the, the voice was stupid. Those people were just totally stupid. Um, they voted for, one lady voted for Tony Abbott because he's such a family man. His daughters are always with him. And they were not always with him. It's only just the week before after that big misogynist kerfuffle. I mean, just absolutely stupid people saying stupid things, making stupid electric, uh, you know, decisions at the electorate. At the, yes, well. How could we... With your, with your voice... No, I'm not holding back, actually. Sorry. Um, we are getting into a bit of a speech here. No, no. No, I just want to, want to ask, how can we get the voice uh, out? How can we make it more widespread? You just mentioned cyberspace. Thank goodness maybe that might be a way. I but, think we should have more writers' festivals. Yeah. <laughs> you say we know, but it might be we here, but it's not the we of the rest of the population that uh, know look, this. Uh, How yeah. do we get the word out? Well, we're all just got to be active and, and, and uh, take the opportunity when we can. But I also think it's true that uh, the old dictum that it's 5% of people who change the way society works and the rest will follow the leadership. I was very privileged to be in the parliament for the time I was there. I was never minister for anything, uh, which is part of the penalty for having a, uh, supporting a, a new sustainable... But you uh, were the sensible voice for everything. Well, uh, you know, it was great being there, but I'm very happy being out of there now and, and making room. There, there are terrific young folk in our society. I keep running into them. I've run into them here at the Perth Writers Festival who are uh, given encouragement and a licence not to be pessimistic because they're intelligent. Uh, we'll get in there amongst the cocksure and change things. And we've got a job with them too. And, I, and inspiriting and, and giving a licence and giving optimism to young people on this planet to follow their heart and their vision of how the planet should be fixed up is incredibly important for, for us older folk who've been through the mill and can see how the land lies. Thank you, that's a great suggestion. There's another question just here. And anyone else put their hand up? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've been a radical greenie from my 20s. I'm, I'm still a radical greenie, but I've, I've been on quite a journey um, in the 30 years. Um, and I've written a thesis on hope. I've come from pessimism to some sort of optimism. Um, and what I've come to is a sense of responsibility, I suppose, that um, coming from my angry 20s to blaming everything out there to appreciating that everything that's out there is also in me, the hate, um, the destructiveness, um, and uh, <laughs> uh, well, the question is about a sense of responsibility, and uh, it's all very well to blame everything out there, but um, what is our own sense of responsibility, I suppose? Well, I, I mean, you've actually, you've, you've spoken directly there to one of the, you know, I said before that there's wisdom in strange places and one of the wisdoms of our spirit, of our tradition with, in terms of our understanding of human nature, for all its faults with original sin, it did do that. There was a sort of sense of the human solidarity that we're all broken, that we're all limited. It made it, it always challenged the idea of just projection that everything was wrong with the other. You know, that we're right, we're okay, and the problem is, in, is with the other. There was, a, there was a sort of human solidarity of broken people. And there's a sort of, there's a sort of, there's a great release and a great power. Martin Luther King found that too. He, he um, the, the strength of that. I mean, if, you, if, you, if, you, if your solidarity, if your brotherhood and sisterhood is only based on the good, we're the good and you're the stuffed over there, you're actually going to have a division always. But when it, 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 is, it is good to hold that with the sense that we all carry, we're all broken people, we all carry within our hearts the capacity for all that badness as well, that actually is a great basis for human solidarity. Not the only basis, but to hold them both, I think. I think it is one of the, wisdom in, one of the wisdoms in the tradition. Yeah, and part and of the democratic underpinning of our society, actually. And a question up here. Thank you. Yes, what I'd, I'd like to ask is, 
many of the countries, for example, in Scandinavia, have socialist governments, um, particularly places like Norway, where I've lived, um, and they seem to have a much, and have done for the last 30 years, a much fairer view of looking after their people, looking after their environment, and more e e equality. What I'd like to ask both of you is, do you think that some of those governments are have a better approach to the environment and looking after their own people, or is that just a political thing? Well, I think no. I think uh, what you say about the Scandinavian companies, countries having a better social uh, tradition, uh, which is being challenged greatly, is true. Mind you, I, uh, I have a great deal of difficulty with the fact that Norway is still whaling, uh, and Iceland is as well. Uh, but uh, you know, I, again, we're all fault, we're all faulty people, and therefore faulty societies. And I believe there are aberrations which will go before too long. Uh, and I think there is a lot to be learned from the uh, Scandinavian tradition. But of course, the rest of the world, capitalist world, that's the last thing they want. And you're not going to find the Murdoch media writing too many editorials about how we should adopt. Uh, greater, a greater social net uh, into the future. And, and one of the things is that's going to pass. That, that's going to pass very quickly. That stranglehold on public opinion, which has been monopolised there for the last few decades. And, uh, you know, things are looking much better in that regard. And very quickly to James on that one. Oh, just, well, just on one aspect of that, that I mean, is that one of the interesting aspects of Scandinavia is, is that the, there is a connection still with memory of place, of relationship to place, of relationship to environment. And I think that that's, um, it's important both in terms of social and environmental sustainability. When we look to the future and we think of the grandchildren, it's also good to draw strength, um, not just condemn, but draw strength from the the grandparents and the great-grandparents. There's a lot of what human beings have, one of the distinctive things about human beings is memory. And memory is, a, is, is well, sure, it's not about uh, celebrating tradition or just adopting the ways that things were done in the past, because there's been a lot of destruction and a lot of suffering and a lot of horror in the past. But in terms of engaging with our different, the different traditions that we have, we can overcome some of the divisions, you know, we can, we can, and we can link into a whole sources of wisdom and power that are there. And I think in Scandinavia, that is one of the reasons why they've been able to have some greater level of consensus about how to build a just society, but also greater levels of concern for the environment is because they've remembered better than that we have. And that's what we're starting to do. I see lots of hope and signs about that um, in, in, in our society as well. Yeah. Thanks, James. And, and our hour is now up, and we have to finish, alas, um, and not take any more questions. But um, uh, you've been a terrific audience, and we've traversed quite a, a bit of stuff in this, uh, in this 50, uh, 50 to 60 minutes or so. So uh, thank you very much for your attendance today, and let's congratulate our guests.